emphasize Emma de Corpus. Clearly, why can't you see it? This is a pesticide issue. If you're a commercial beekeeper and your bees are dying off and you're losing vast amounts of money and you're hauling bees across the country and you're putting 400 hives on the back of a truck and you're putting a net over that and you let them sit in the diesel exhaust flume for 3,000 miles across the country, that's not what's doing it. No, 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 no. That's not what's causing the die off. It's got to be a mystery disease organism. There's some undiagnosed pathogenic whatever, no zema, who knows what. So we go through this list of things, it's about six or seven items long, that it could be, and then counts begin to build up, not really based on science, but just based on eagerness, perception, sheer numbers, on what that cause could possibly be. Then others of you really get creative. It's a terrorist plot to undermine our food supply. Well, you, you folks chuckled. I think the guy would have taken my face off if I had chuckled. So you gotta stand there and stay serious. Well. Why do you think? Well, think about it. Think about it. Bees are fundamental to our uh, pollination and food production supply. So if a terrorist wants to really undermine that, just kill the bees. Okay. I got no science for it. I got no science against. I'm not trying to change your mind. But you're the first one. It's dust from the Iraqi war that's settling here. It's a rapture. I mean, everything comes along that's possible causes for the CCD thing. I really am sorry. We don't know what it is. We don't even know for sure if it is. But something is something is tinkering with our bees, more or less, in different places, different seasons. Something has tinkered with our bees in the past. We used to call it disappearing disease. Before that, spring dwelling. Roughly before that, colony collapsed. This goes back a long time, but I don't have any footing for telling you that those episodes were what is causing the most recent episode. What I do want to tell you is that this last episode, for the first time in our mechanical history, had the full power of the electronic whip. It was a staggering thing to watch work. I mean, I used to walk indoors at meetings, and I generally knew more than you folks. I walk indoors at meetings now and take my name tag off and try to keep a low profile because I don't want to talk to you about some web page you found in New Zealand that said, yes, it's true, you can't keep these underwater somewhere in New Zealand. I haven't seen that web page. I don't know anything about it. But in general, the web now is the central source of what goes on. New ways of doing old things. We used to read bee magazines. We still do. Kim has web pages. Data has web pages. We go to the web. We do blogs. We talk amongst ourselves. We basically communicate at the speed of light. That was shocking to see work in this CCD episode. In years past, it had taken us three months to find out that somebody had a bee die off in New Mexico. Now it takes us a millisecond at the speed of light. And so the overall perception was that the end of the world was at hand. Possibly it is. Possibly it is not. I don't know. I'm going to fall off this stage sooner or later. So can I just go ahead and admit that when I fall, I'm not going to say anything about it. <laughs> Gleanings and bee culture. Shortage of bees reduces food crops. As was expected, the fruit crop in some areas will be somewhat reduced owing to the unusually severe winter. An article on this subject appeared June the 5th issue of the Ohio Farmer states that many Ohio fruit growers are now depending entirely on wild bees for pollination. It also states that the wild bee population is essentially decimated and that it may or may not be replaced. Comparably few people realize the importance of honeybees and other pollinating insects to agriculture. The honeybee population of the country is not what it might be, it's not what it should be. In the old days, practically every farmer owned a few hives of bees. That's no longer the case. For the dramatics of the situation, I hold up a recent copy of Gleanings in Bee Culture, and then I sneakily pull out Gleanings in Bee Culture from my birth month, July 1948. It could be in this magazine for all practical purposes. It sounds the same. It reads the same. 
So while some things change dramatically, other things are remarkably the same. We have gone through a significant number of changes through the years, and I've gone to great extremes and lengths. This room doesn't lend itself well to PowerPoint, trying different things. But you folks in the back will do the best we can to help out. This is an original Langstroth High. This was the granddad. Before this, in our beekeeping history, there was all of this remarkable argument about what kind of hive to use, what style of hive to use, big hive, little hive, tall hive, long hive, short hive, square hive, some of the most ornate things you have ever conceivably seen. This one tended to rise to the top. It was a clever gadget, and the thing that still totally intrigues me, can you help me turn it sideways? It's like me. It's old and creaky and fragile. That's a 60 joke. was one poplar board. The side of this beehive was one board that they split to make this opening down the side. <coughs> then and now, we're convinced that if I were a bee, these are the kind of things I would want in a perfect beehive. Got to have a veranda. So you can sit on the front porch, Watch other bees go by. It needs to be close to good schools. Or something along that line. It should be painted white. Well, you paint it white and it reflects heat. So, don't you want some of that heat in the summer? I mean, in the winter? They paint it white because that was a common house color paint. So, we have just infused beekeeping from our earliest days 